Why? Because for us to use it, meaning eukaryotes, it has to be in a specific position. It comes in three different positions, SN1, SN2, and SN3. And I'm assuming your audience is, is smart enough to figure out what that means, but... D define it a little bit for us because we don't get into a lot of physical chemistry stuff. Yeah, the glycerol backbone of, uh, of lipids has, you know, a, a carbon chain and the SN1, SN2, and SN3 position are which carbon it's linked to. It turns out for eukaryotes like us, meaning primates, uh, it works and it's only incorporated into the brain and into the left and melanocortin pathway when it's in the SN2 position. Uh, so that's the reason why people need to eat fish and not take fish oil because fish oil tends to be in SN1 and SN3. We need the fish to do the job for us. So that's the other reason you don't want to use algal fish oil as hmm. well. And what's the quantum reason that this is important? It turns out the SN2 position is very planar. It looks just like a copper wire. It has pi electrons on the top and bottom, which means that it works really well. So you need to know where is the most common place? What's the place with the highest density of SN2 DHA in the human body? It's in the central retinal pathways that connect your retina to that leptin receptor that Nick's been wanting to chomp at and get to. Hmm. So, so you're saying, yeah, so basically one, one way of saying some of what you just said is that we talk about fish oil, we talk about omega-3 fatty acids, we talk about DHA. And from a biochemical perspective, you might say, well, the DHA that's in my fish oil is the same that's in the fish I could have eaten, but it's not. There's a physical difference in, in some of the structure. Right. And that's the key word. The, the word that you're going to keep coming back to when you realize how much you have to unlearn is biochemistry taught you no know biophysics. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it turns out that when you really see my decentralized perspective, you're going to find out that there is nothing in biology that's a fundamental science. In fact, physics is the basics of biology. And biology gets really easy to understand when you understand this key part. But this story that we're going through, once you get hemoglobin, then what are the hemoglobins that most people know about? Well, you know about myoglobin, that's in muscles, tends to be more um, hypoxic. Why? Because you have lactate biology going on in those cells. And then you have something called methemoglobin. Methemoglobin, I don't think they learn too much about it in, in PhD biochemistry, because I don't think they understand too much about it, but doctors do. And the reason why is because sometimes we have to treat people that have this type of hemoglobinopathy. And what does it do? It binds uh, oxygen really good and doesn't let it go at all. And it's a real problem. And to treat those people in the clinic, we usually have to give them something called methylene blue. And methylene blue unbinds the oxygen and turns it back into oxygen carrying hemoglobin. So what just happened there? You just learned something about methylene blue. What it, does it really do? It changes the oxidation state of iron from plus three to plus two. Mm. Okay. That's effectively what happens. So then hemoglobin becomes able to deliver the oxygen to the tissues who need it. Mm. The point that I'm trying to make to you is I just explained to you, we have three different hemoglobins. Now for the people who are really paying attention to the office there, they probably realize, well, there's thalassemia, there's G6PD, there's sickle cell anemia. Yeah. These are all different hemoglobins that evolved 